It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? I trust that you feel that way. I certainly do today. Today we're going to be examining God's word. We'll be in the uh, letter to the Ephesians, to the Christians who were at Ephesus. We'll be in chapter 4 and at verses 13 through 16. That'll be our focus this morning. Last Lord's Day, uh, we saw what a great gift giver uh, God was uh, when we examined God's blueprint for the body of Christ. And this week, I kind of posed the hypothetical question, what happens when we follow God's plan? So if I could, may I ask those of you that are healthy enough to stand for the reading of God's infallible, inerrant, and holy word. And I'll back us up to verse 7, and we'll be reading until verse 16. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until, and this is the part that we'll be focusing in on this this week, verse 13 on, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the full knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, so that we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body being joined and held together by what every joint supplies according to the properly measured working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Thus far are the words of today's Holy Scripture. You may be seated. Isaiah reminds us, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, that lasts forever. The gospel writers got it right when they quoted Jesus, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So let's uh, pray one more time. Dear God, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found to be acceptable in your sight, because you indeed are our rock and our redeemer. So God, take the truths of your word that uh, become evidenced in our minds today and drive them to our feet, Lord, so that we can be consistent in doing what we say. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to go through that last part one more time. That is verses 13 through 16 that we'll be focusing in on. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, so that we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, being joined and held together by what every joint supplies according to the properly measured working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So our message today is entitled, What Happens When We Follow God's Plan? And I'm guessing that most of us are pretty adept at answering the negative corollary to that question, aren't we? We know this one 
we can many times answer, what happens when I don't follow God's plan? Well, uh, let's do today what faith-filled children do, shall we? Let's learn the right way first, and then let's obey God. And uh, what is the way for us to grow as Christians? And uh, there are five means of growth that I tell every single person who I've ever led to Christ. These are the five means of growth for the Christian. Uh, there's the, the vertical axis, uh, which is the Bible and the word of God. So think of this as a cross and the vertical beam on the cross is the way to grow in the Christian life is prayer and the word. Prayer is you talking to God. The word is God talking to you. And then we have the horizontal bar of the, of the cross, and that is fellowship and witnessing. Fellowship is you talking about Christ to Christians. And witnessing is you talking about Christ to non-Christians. And right in the very center, where the horizontal and the vertical meet, is worship. So the way we grow as a Christian is by having all five of these elements in our lives at all times. And that's in effect what we're talking about this week. We are to walk worthy. We are to recognize that the body of Christ, that's the church, is the place where our spiritual gifts are valued and come into use. We should be additionally memorizing scripture so that the Holy Spirit can bring us to maturity by recalling scripture to our minds at times of great temptation. All of these things fit in God's plan for our future. God's blueprint for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, the church, you know, that should lead to expected results. So what should it look like? What should it be composed of, this church? What do these people within the church even look like? And in the confusing background of our culture today, I can't blame anybody for not knowing these things. But here's the way our text begins. Until we all attain to the unity of faith. I went ahead, I guess, a little too far, did I? Well, not quite. Our text says this. Until we all attain to the unity of faith. This clause, it started with the word mekri, which we translate until. And the Greek until implies that a result is to be forthcoming. There's a time when we will produce. And the word for attain, it says until we all attain, that word implies a very sure thing. And it also implies, and this is something that we miss a lot of times, a bit of a struggle because there's an enemy. It implies amidst opposition that we shall attain to this unity of faith. Literally, unto the oneness of faith in Christ. We are to be able to keep unity of spirit in the bond of faith. Now, Hebrews 11, 6 describes this for us. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who draws near to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those, and I like the uh, New American Standard at this point, who diligently seek him. All true believers have been given faith. They have this in common. In Romans 4, 20 and 21, this continues the thought, Paul continues that thought when he describes Abraham 
Yet with respect to the promise of God, he, that is Abraham, did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to do. Now let me just clarify this. Are all of you on board knowing that Abraham was now somewhere between 90 and 100 years old? And God had told him through your progeny, through your seed, all of these things are going to come to pass. Now, a year goes by and then another year goes by and then another year goes by and then another year goes by. This guy had great faith. Come on. You imagine how that would eat at you? Year after year after year, here you are giving glory to God, fully assured that what God had promised he was able to do. Abraham's often seen as the preeminent example of faith. This verse tells us that God doesn't waste any motion at all. What we call initiatory faith always leads to ongoing faith. When God puts that little seed in you, it blossoms. And notice with me that Abraham's faith in, in, in verse 21, God gave, he gave glory to God. In other words, he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. And others gave glory because of the evidence of that faith. Just the evidence of the faith. So faith in believers is not silent. It's not hidden. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew 5, 16 said uh, this, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So people, even outsiders, can give glory to God because of the outworking of faith. There's even a, a priority to the outworking of faith. Even a priority to it in Galatians 6, 9 and 10. And let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So, in churches, a mercy ministry goes first to believers, then to unbelievers. Believers are the household of faith. You follow the guy with the blueprint. As he walks around a piece of dirt and tells you what the church is going to look like, you follow the guy with the blueprint. He's the general contractor. In our case, Christ. You discover your gifts. You exercise your gifts within the church. You become a part of the building team. And you become part of the household of faith. We are unified around a faith that has been placed within us. And we are forever grateful. A second result in following God's plan is growth in the knowledge of Christ as the Son of God. You know, there were battles fought over the very nature of Christ. Scripture tells us that the knowledge of God is critical to who we are in Christ. Proverbs 9 reminds us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So the fear of the Lord is a very real reverence that requires an indwelling faith. What we might call the knowledge of God. God places faith in us and our eyes are opened. In this verse, the word for knowledge is epigenosko. Epi means super, super know, super understanding. 
epigenosko, uh, what we might call the knowledge of God. And so it implies full knowledge directed toward an object. There are actually, in this particular clause, there are three genitives of possession. And, and basically that means um, there was some opposition going on here. Probably the Gnostic heretics were there saying, we're the smart people, we know what to do. And there were younger Christians saying, it doesn't make sense what you're teaching us. All believers are united by this faith. That's what scripture says. And they share a common conviction that Jesus is the only way. Isaiah 53, 11 is a tough one for Jewish folks to stomach because it tells us about the suffering servant. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. There are plenty of Jewish scholars who were in Jesus' day who didn't accept the concept of the Messiah coming first as the suffering servant. Isaiah 53 details this for those that care to see with open eyes. Matthew 11:27 says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. What we learn here is that Knowledge of the Son of God is essential for one's salvation. When I have the opportunity to share the gospel message with someone genuinely seeking answers, I always ask the question, who would you say that Jesus is? It sobers people up because so many people haven't given it much thought at all. And their answers even seem silly to them. But this text, Matthew eleven twenty seven, tells us that Christians share something in common. Jesus has given them God knowledge, father knowledge, son knowledge. In John sixteen three, Jesus said there would be martyrdom and harassment because others do not have this knowledge. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. And John 17, 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. At this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pile on that particular topic. I'd like to go through pretty quickly eight verses there. So, in John 17, 25 and 26, we have, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. And 2 Corinthians 4, 6 for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And Philippians 3.8. More than that, I count all things to be lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. And Colossians 2.2, 2, so that their hearts may be encouraged, having been held together in love, even unto all the wealth of the full assurance of understanding, unto the full knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. That's epigonosco. Second Peter 1, Simeon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received the same kind of faith as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything 
pertaining to life and godliness through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And 2 Peter 3.8, For if those things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor use unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Last one, 1 John 5.20, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. What happens when we follow God's plan? Where we're blessed. We are blessed with the unity of faith. It envelops us in love from the Son so much that we want to share it with others. And as we follow, we find that our knowledge of Jesus Christ is expanded and becomes critical if we are to interpret Scripture correctly. Thirdly, we are to blossom as Christians. Absolutely blossom. We are to consistently grow into strong spiritual maturity. In the 1920s and 30s, Grandma Saddam I had a Grandma Dost and a Grandma Saddam. This was Grandma Saddam. She gave birth to seven children in the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is barely in the United States. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't just seven children because there was a lot of heartache in the Saddam household. Because in addition to the seven children, there were eight miscarriages. There were two stillborns. And the eldest child, Paul, died in his 20s. So really, only six reached maturity. God says that's what we need to aspire to. The text in verse 13 says the Christian is to grow to a mature person, a mature man or woman, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 14, 20, that reminds us, brothers, don't be children in your thinking. Rather, in evil, be infants. But in your thinking, be mature. In Colossians 1, 28, him we proclaim admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. That phrase, the measure of the stature, causes me to think of the awkwardness, especially of male adolescence. Amidst all the problems with pimples and crackling voices, there's the issue of height. Boys rejoice when they gain the height of the man in the house. They absolutely rejoice. Well, Paul adds to this the fullness of Christ, which is like the fullness of Christ in Ephesians 319, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Paul sets the bar really high here. And yet, some people even today actually profess to be perfect with a standard like this that they're to be measured by. All I can say is no pastor has finished his work when the sheep fall so far short of the goal. We are to be ever maturing in Christ's likeness. C.S. Lewis once wrote, God allows us to experience the low points of life in order to teach us lessons that we could learn in no other way. What happens when we follow God's plan? Well, we're blessed with the unity of faith and which envelops us 
in love from the Son. As we follow, we find that our full knowledge of Jesus Christ is expanded and becomes a critical guide for us if we are to interpret Scripture correctly. Thirdly, we're to blossom as Christians. We are to consistently grow into spiritual maturity. Regarding spiritual maturity, Paul David Tripp, a current author, once wrote, We forget that God's primary goal is not changing our situations or relationships so that we can be happy, but changing us through our situations and relationships so that we will be holy. And fourthly, we are to strive to always possess sound doctrine. Our text reminds us that we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Some Christians, maybe small c Christians, are quite content to remain babes in Christ. They never cut their eye teeth. Victims of every charlatan who comes along. Or in your case or my case, victim of every televangelist. Let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 5. A kind of a difficult passage for some and see if we can't get sounder in our faith here. Hebrews 5, 11 to 14 Concerning him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant." But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. He doesn't want God's people to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. The text indicates that those people are continually thrown for a loop. What is it that James, the Lord's half-brother, writes in his tiny book? James 1, verses 6, 7, and 8. But he must ask in faith, doubting nothing. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. He is in the churning white water, He's agitated by the waves. He compares himself to those who do not rest themselves on the word of God. They're like tiny little boats tossed here and there with the doctrine of men. He warns them that it comes about not only by shabby thinking, but also by outside opponents. Not only by the unsteadiness of the man's brain, but also by the craftiness of certain people outside of his life. They do it by slight, we're told, deviousness. The text indicates with the throw of the dice, and the dice are loaded. There's cleverness and trickiness. He is warning, protects against false teaching. What do we read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11? Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So what good is sound doctrine? Well, I can think of three reasons it's really a good thing. It will grow you out of childhood and adolescence. Another thing it'll do, it'll stabilize your mind giving you a logical framework to work from. Thirdly, it'll enable you to combat evil thoughts and the evil one. 
Lastly, you will surely possess an authentic, loving testimony. Your walk will line up with your talk. What does scripture say in John 13, 34 and 35? A new commandment I give to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. So you also are to love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Your new life in Christ will totally transform you. You cannot stay the same person. James chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Let me just back that up a little bit. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them, this is what's inferred here, you do not give them what's necessary for their body, and you could easily do that, and you have it right there in your back room, 1 Peter 1, 22, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a love of the brothers without hypocrisy, fervently love one another from the heart. Incidentally, forgiveness, which we dealt with in Sunday school today, is a key to genuine Christianity. Are you quick to forgive. Very important. Are you quick to forgive? And let me just take a little aside here and say, you know, there are some of us who say, I can forgive, but I can't forget. I don't think so. We forgive because we've been forgiven much. We forgive because we've been forgiven much. Let me illustrate. True story. The first uh, year of my marriage to my beloved bride, uh, something came up, and uh, she asked for forgiveness. I granted forgiveness. A week or two later, we were in a brisk argument. And where do you think I went? I went right to that weak spot. And uh, she looked at me with the first tear coming down her face. And she said, um, I thought you forgave me. I said, wow, you're, you're right. I need to ask for your forgiveness now. Um, Here's what I learned. When you say you forgive somebody, you make a choice. I mean, they, they could have screwed you over in a hundred different ways. And you still make a choice. Because you've been forgiven so much from Jesus by Jesus the Christ, you make a choice. I will not ever use that against you. I am forgiving you. Now, if you say you can't forget, here's the problem. Here's the problem. It's going to come up the back of your throat and hit your tongue just like mine did. And in, in that moment, you're going to have the chance to either bite it off because you can't use that. And here's the problem. That's what you're supposed to be doing. That's what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be not mentioning it. And suppose it comes up the next week and you don't mention it again. And it comes up the next week and you don't mention it again. And it comes up the next week and you don't mention it again. Pretty soon you get really frustrated, don't you? And pretty soon you forget it because you can't use it. That's why forgive and forget is a quick way to say, I forgive partially. 
can't be done. The good test of your genuine Christianity is, do I have a very strong, very quick forgiver inside, or is my forgiver broken? Am I forgetting how much God forgave me? I must forgive this person this tiny bit in comparison. So how might we apply this message? I don't have to tell you this, do I? You already know. The Holy Spirit is so good. So good. You know, when we, when we go through and have our quiet time each day, when we go through and have our quiet time, you know, things are, are targeted right at us. Then we see these things in God's word. And then we say, God, show me how to explain this. And in the next nanosecond, the Holy Spirit says, here, Jan, here's how you can explain it. Here, here's how you can use this. And I go, oh, no, not that. That's the way to spiritual maturity is to say, okay. Okay. So what happens when we follow God's plan? We're blessed with the unity of faith, enveloping us in love from the Son so that we want to share with others. And we find, secondly, that our full knowledge of Jesus Christ is expanded and becomes a critical guide for us if we are to interpret Scripture correctly. And then, when we follow God's plan, we blossom as Christians. We consistently grow towards spiritual maturity. And then we are to strive to always possess sound doctrine. I've been in churches where people say, well, we don't want to concentrate on doctrine here. Well, how are you going to get to truth unless you can prove it? Um, the Westminster Confession of Faith is such a good document. And there's even a book called The Westminster Confession of Faith for Study Classes. And you, you read one of the articles in the Westminster Confession of Faith, and then the man explains it. And then he asks you questions about what he just explained, and you realize you didn't understand that completely. And you've got to go back and read it a second time. You've got to go back and read it a third time. The great thing about that book, The Westminster Confession of Faith, Four Study Classes by G.I. Williamson, the great thing about that book is that the answers are in the back. <laughs> so you can work yourself through the entire book all by yourself. And it's really an accurate book. As a pastor, when I first came out of seminary, I was uh, in the Evangelical Free Church denomination. And uh, they would use the Westminster Shorter Catechism, or, but never the whole thing. And so I decided to, I, I ought to read the whole thing. And I read the whole thing and I showed it to Peg and I said, you know, I kind of believe all this. She read it and she said, yeah, I kind of believe all that too. I wonder why our denomination doesn't use it. I still don't know. <laughs> let, me, let me close in prayer. Oh, you know, the last one down there, we own an authentic, loving testimony. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for the treasure that your word is. We thank you, Lord, as your Holy Spirit uh, delicately, so many times, uh, moves us uh, toward facing the facts and uh, apologizing to people. Uh, your Holy Spirit points out where in Scripture uh, we're violating Scripture. God, thank you for the, the sweet relationship that you give to each one of your children. God, we pray that we can grow closer and closer to you through the balance of our time here so that we can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.